You're listening to the Tuning Into Sci-Fi TV Last Call, where Kevin, Wendy, and Brent talk about anything and everything that couldn't quite squeeze into the regular show. Today we talk about Wayward Pines, Person of Interest, Arrow, Dragon Con, Game of Thrones, Continuum, and Salem. Hey everyone, welcome back. Let's see what Brent's got to talk about. Just one thing, I just wanted to briefly talk about the uh, episode of Wayward Pines, episode 3 of season 1's premiere uh, season. Uh, this was Our Town, Our Law. Now, I, I have been finding this epi- this series to be kind of interesting, but not great. Um, definitely has a genre element to it with the whole you know, town surrounded by the wall, leaving one side, coming in the other side. You know, the, the fences, the, the mysteriousness of it, the people who who uh, you saw two weeks ago uh, arrived in town 19 years ago, that sort of thing, <laughs> whatever it was. Um, strange stuff like that happening. But um, this episode got a little more interesting to me, and I, th- I think it was the, the most exciting for me of the season because um, last episode you got what I thought was a very brutal killing of the, the one ally our hero had in town who was trying to escape with him, and she was caught, and, and basically they didn't sl- slice her throat. They just basically cut her, her artery in her neck and just let her bleed out while she was tied up. And and it was just really gruesome, but the whole town was there and they were like celebrating it. And it just, ugh, just feels very, very um, strange and and disgusting to me. But uh, in this episode, you get the situation where um, our hero is desperately trying to get back to his family. Right. So what they decide to do is they decide to kidnap his family and bring his family to, to wayward pines. And, and sure enough, his, uh, his wife and, and son appear and, and then they want to leave because they don't like Wayward Pines. And then the sheriff comes and, and starts to, uh, you know, to, to stop them. And, and he's about to kill, uh, I think, the son who had tried to uh, hit, hit, tried to attack him. And uh, then the husband, you know, attacks him. And then there's this fighting. And then he's about to kill the husband when the son kills him or rolls over him with the car. Doesn't kill him. Rolls over him with the sheriff's own car. Our hero gets the gun and actually kills the sheriff or seems to. And as they're getting in the car to drive away and uh, they open the door to leave through the wall, something non-human scurries in and grabs the body and scurries out. And they close the door and they drive away and we're, we're left to wonder, are they even on Earth anymore? Uh, where are they? Where is this town? What is that from the outside that, that wasn't human? It wasn't a, doesn't look like any animal on Earth. What, what was that? Um, you know, what is the big secret? And, and as the sheriff said before our hero shot him dead, he said, you know, you don't want to know the truth. That's more horrible than you can imagine or whatever. He said something of that effect. Um, so I find those developments to be pretty intriguing to the point where I, I really do want to see what happens next. Well, I think it's doing a better job for you than for me. I don't know. I'm just feeling like it's taking too long. It's, it's just doing, it's got some interesting bits. You mentioned the genre potential elements. From, you know, incorrect time movement to a town with a giant wall to to everything that we've kind of seen there. But to me, it's just the same old, same old every episode of our hero walking around, being cranky, everyone else telling him to submit and become part of our cult. Um, so it's not really doing anything special for me yet. I'm on board because I've been told by some other people who have seen it that, yes, by episode five, it's full genre mode. So it's the perfect time of year. Uh, May finals have finished for a lot of our shows. Uh, a lot of the other shows we watch mid June haven't started yet, so I'm good. But once I get a bunch of shows going, I got to tell you right now, this one is very low for me on the list. It's just, you know, got a smidge of interest for me right now because it's it hasn't really hooked me. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm not hooked um, mainly because I'm not all that interested in this. Uh, I'll call it red herring which is the wife is upset about him being with this lover, whatever she is. I did raise an eyebrow when they were talking about the time differential because his ex-partner thinks she's been in this town for 12 years, and he says it's only been five weeks since he last saw her. So that kind of raised an eyebrow. And then, as you mentioned, Brent, at the very end, when something comes and takes the body of the sheriff. And I was very surprised that the sheriff was killed off so easily because he's been such a menacing presence up to this point in the episode. So I, I'm hoping that we're now going to sort of get into second gear and start unpacking some actual story because 
there isn't enough suspension and tension for me uh, from what they've gotten so far. Um, I do like Matt Dillon. I was really sad to see that they had killed off the, the one ally he had met last week because I like that actor and hopefully, you know, now he and the wife and the kid are going to become a little unit <laughs> and do something. Um, I'm not interested to see, you know, him living in one house and them living down the street thinking he's a cheater or something. I, I'll be much more interested if they live in a place where they're under surveillance, but you see them trying to, um, circumvent it and, uh, you know, have an agenda, something going on. So hopefully that will start up soon. Whereas I'm completely opposite. I don't want that to happen. I want them to just move. I want them to reveal what the big secret is next week. I want them to like uh, make an escape attempt. I want them to, you know, I want this thing to go bigger than it is and just start, keep growing and, and get more and more exciting. I don't want to see them, you know, trying to live under, under a watchful eye and try to, you know, arrange, slowly arrange their own you know, escape or rebellion or whatever that, that to me, that would be boring. That'd be a failure. And I probably would lose interest pretty quickly. Yeah. I, that's not what I'm meaning. <laughs> what I'm meaning is that they do start to have a plan and we see them execute the plan by being able to pretend to be going along with whatever, but, but not um, just watching them pretend, but actually seeing the plan as well as the, the covering up. Okay. But that's, uh, that's all I want to talk about. Okay. Kevin, what you got? couple of items. First one, uh, which many of you will probably get a kick out of, is to let you know that I have started watching Person of Interest. Uh, I've got the first couple of episodes of season one under my belt. Uh, Brent has given me a suggested uh, watch list where I'll be skipping a good part of season one and, and a good part of season two uh, based on his recommendations. Again, available time. I can't, there's no way I could watch every episode of this one. But uh, uh, so two episodes in, uh, certainly well done. I'm, I'm, you know, slightly interested in what's going on here. I know it's going to take a couple of big turns. So, uh, based on hearing some discussions, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for a lot more to kind of happen, but it was a good introduction and, uh, I, I'm certainly enjoying what I'm seeing so far. And I got to say, uh, I appreciate, uh, you know, uh, I'm the type that shares on social media when I'm watching shows, you know, uh, check-ins and such. And, Got to say, the amount of comments and feedback I got on uh, Facebook, especially for those episodes, and there's a lot of you folks who are listening who are very excited that I'm watching and are fans of this show, so it's great to see that. So I will be continuing, and uh, you know, probably during the summer when I've got a little time, I'll try to be getting in an episode here and there. So looking forward to getting deeper into the show. Very cool. Yeah, that's great to hear, and uh, yeah, by, by this skipping, you are, of course, going to miss some of the callbacks that Scott always talks about. But I have to tell you, Kevin, I'm I'm here, uh, as you kind of did already once. But whenever you see someone in the show and you're like, uh, what the heck was that? Who is that? How, am I supposed to know who that is? Just ask me an email. I'll be happy to tell you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I know I've got you and Scott as go-to folks if I need to get some stuff filled in before I start watching every episode on a regular basis a little later in season two. But uh uh, I did have a couple folks asking, oh, you know, I've been meaning to watch this show too. Uh, where is it streaming? Unfortunately, it's not streaming legally anywhere. Uh, the only option I had aside from purchasing the DVDs is actually I'm getting them via Netflix on DVD. But unfortunately, folks is, uh, excuse me, places like Hulu and Netflix and even CBS Online uh, don't have this show. Certainly not all the episodes going back to the beginning. So uh, if you are someone expressing an interest, another reason to enter our contest to potentially win season one. Or uh, if you've got a DVD plan from Netflix, they do have everything that way. So that's the way I'm going about it. Yeah, it is disappointing sometimes when I want to watch something on uh, Netflix online and you can only get it on DVD. Yeah, we've all gotten pretty used to this uh, amazingly instant access of everything, haven't we? So. Yep. Yeah, you know, a little bit of planning had to go into to getting those discs. Uh, next item I wanted to mention, kind of a fandom side of things for those of you who uh, who are where I do the Arrow Squad po podcast for Arrow. And um, some of you might have noticed on Facebook, if you're following Stephen Amell or some other Arrow folks, uh, I did an interview with a uh, girl by the name of Danielle Taylor. Uh, name may or may not be familiar to you, but uh, she is a girl who just graduated from high school. And, uh, and we'll have a link in the show notes, uh, who wasn't a big fan of the theme that they were doing for her prom. So she's a big Arrow fan. So she decided to go as uh, a character she calls the Arrow S, which uh, she got a beautiful dress. She set up a green dress. It's got a hood and everything. She has a friend who's also a Flash fan who went in a red dress. Uh, so they kind of went with a the theme that way. And, you know, she's a very creative person, too. 
uh, if you follow the uh, and listen to the interview I did with her, uh, she does painting and some other things. So uh, she really put a lot of effort into that uh, costume, and uh, she shared some of the photos with Stephen, and he passed them and reshared them himself. And her original posting has now got tens of thousands of likes and lots of comments from other folks appreciating that you know she kind of did something she wanted to do, didn't uh, kind of just stick to the. Uh, what was put out to her. So uh, if you want to hear from a fan and kind of how she approached doing that, she's also someone whose family, mother and father and her brother attend Dragon Con. So she's going to be there this year and is going to bring her costume. And hopefully since Stephen Amell is listed as a guest this year, uh, meet up with them and get a photo op. So it was kind of cool. So the link in the show notes will take you to about a 20 minute interview that I did with her. Yeah, I remember seeing this on Stephen Amell's Facebook page back when um, she had originally sent him the picture and I just think it's awesome that, um, you know, teen kids who maybe in the past would have like not gone to their prom because they hated the theme, but instead uh, got really creative and got their friend together and made two really cool costumes. Um, So that was just awesome. And I'm really hoping to see this person at Dragon Con because I'd love to see her dress up close. Uh, It looked really, really beautiful. Yeah, this is really cool, and I do hope that uh, she gets a chance to meet Stephen at the at the con. And and uh, this just to me just also kind of proves how far uh, you know geek culture and genre fandom has come. Because back when I was in high school, if somebody had done something like this, they'd just be laughed at and ridiculed. But today, it's cool. Everybody thinks it's cool. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I did talk to her in the interview about you know what was the reception like again, knowing kids in high school in that age, and she was like, eh, a couple of people kind of gave me a double look, but. She said it really wasn't that big a deal. She got more of a kick out of, I think she said after prom or before prom, they did like went out to dinner, family and such. And she wore the whole outfit. And she actually had one of the, uh, I think it was the, one of the cooks at the restaurant saw her and came out and said, oh, you're a fan of Arrow. And she got such a kick out of that. So yeah, exactly. It's nice nowadays that, you know, more and more folks are aware of these things. And and, uh, that's where it's just pretty cool to see. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's very, very cool. Uh, the last time to mention, kind of sticking with the Dragon Con theme here, those of you who are fans of the Saudi B Movie Reel podcast or B Movies know that uh, for the last uh, four or five years, I've uh, co-hosted an event at Dragon Con called the Sci-Fi Drive-In Theater Heckle Along, uh, where we've selected a you know a crazy creature movie to do an MST3K type event uh, and have a lot of fun, drinking games, giveaway DVDs, and uh, we've selected the title that we're going to screen this year. Uh, we've kind of gone beyond the the more current titles, the Sharktopuses and Mega Piranhas, going to go with a uh, cheesy classic, one of the, probably in my mind, one of the best so bad it's good movies, and that is Star Crash from 1979, very much a Star Wars homage slash ripoff with uh, the lovely Carolyn uh, Monroe as Stella Star in the lead and a lot of very bad acting and, and bad dubbing and fun stuff and David Hasselhoff in one of his first roles. So we're gonna I think we're gonna have a blast with this one. Yeah, I've been able to um not attend all of both of these uh last couple of years that I've been going to Dragon Con, but uh it's always fun to go to these and uh, I think this is a great choice. Um David Hasselhoff is sort of prime red meat for heckling. Um uh, plus I'm glad that uh you know we're going to space, sort of. Oh, prime red meat. I see see what you did there. That was pretty funny. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, The um, the movie choice, when you first said it here, Kevin, uh, and we're talking about it, I was thinking to myself, yeah, I I probably saw that. I don't really remember it much. But then when you said Hasselhoff, I'm like, the Hoff's in this? Oh, I got to check this out again. Yeah, it's it's got lots of fun stuff. And yes, as you said, Wendy, kind of deciding to go to space, try it a little differently this year. I mean, it's been wonderful because... Literally every year, the event has been moved to a larger room. I mean, we keep drawing a lot of folks. Last year was wonderful. They had to cut off the line because uh, it got so crowded, we ran out of space. And according to Kelly, uh, who we had on the podcast from time to time, who runs the American Sci-Fi Classics track, who, excuse me, the American Sci-Fi Media track, Joe Crow, who runs the classic track, is the one who co-hosts it with me. They're, uh, uh, if plans hold, they're moving us to an even bigger ballroom too. So we're looking forward to having a good time. Yeah, plus they give away all kinds of fun prizes as well at the very end. So it's a lot of fun. And that's it for me this week. Okay, um, just a couple things. One is I want to remind folks that the um, Game of Thrones bonus podcast, the Small Council's running a contest and you can win 
any season of Game of Thrones on Blu-ray or DVD up to $50. Uh, this is open to worldwide, so other regions. That's why we had to cap the value. Because <laughs> some of those are regionless uh, collections are a little expensive. Uh, and you can also win a um, Histories of Westeros book that um, all you have to do is leave us a voicemail. And even if you're not watching Game of Thrones, you can enter and leave us a voicemail uh, to enter. So I want to encourage folks to do that. We'll be running this for another couple weeks. Yeah, this is a great contest, and I'm kind of surprised there aren't a lot of entries so far. So, I mean, that's good news for you if you're listening and you want to win this stuff. Your odds are pretty good. Yeah, it is. It's a nice prize. I mean, again, not not a big fan, but I think, as I mentioned last week, just taking a look at the book and the other stuff that's in there, folks, this is some pretty valuable content with a good shot to win just by uh, taking a couple minutes to get involved. Yeah, I actually got the book um, through my library because <laughs> I wanted to read it. And it's a beautiful book, but uh, also just the bonus features on all seasons of Game of Thrones are really fantastic, too. So definitely encourage folks to check it out. I also want to talk about um, Continuum as we're continuing our Season 3 rewatch. This episode is Episode 6, Wasted Minute. And on rewatch, there was so much more going on in this episode than I remembered. Um, you know, the big news is Kira finally makes her choice about which Alec. And I think it's going to be an open question whether she picks the right one or not. But... Uh, Alec, who uh, had stayed in the original timeline, is the one she picks by the end. She takes our, quote, original Alec and hands him over to the freelancers. Uh, the other thing that I very much jumped out at me on the rewatch was originally when we had the Liberate robbing the bank and going into all these safe deposit boxes, I never really thought about that again, but it turns off they're paying that off because the um the caper that liberate pulls off this week is related to information they stole from the safe deposit boxes of sun manto and it turns out that they're not stealing um some proprietary chemicals they're stealing their waste but uh it can actually be used to turn into a bioweapon and we also learn that um sun manto uh which Kira thinks of as a good company because in the future they were the provider of the uh, cure for a virus. And she actually has a vaccine that prevents her from being affected by this bioweapon. But it turns out they also created the weapon. And we also learned that bioweapons are much more accepted in the future than they are today in terms of biochemical warfare. So there was some interesting seed planting here of how Kira is sort of getting a, a new look at um, these corporations that she, in the future, had viewed as positive. Uh, by the end of this episode, she's not quite thinking the same way about Sun Manto. Uh, we also have, a, I'll call them Original Alec and Emily trying to get out of town and failing. We had a little caper where Original Alec tries to break into Pyron in order to clear Emily's record. Um, that doesn't work. He and Alec have a, a big fight, which leads to Kira shooting original Alec and handing him over to the freelancers. And we also see more of um, the freelancers, sort of, I'll call it um, interpersonal conflicts going on, which uh, originally I sort of had viewed them as all one team, but we see that there's a lot of uh, conflicting ideas amongst this team. You have um, Catherine, the leader, who is almost trying to convince Kira, uh, you know, that um, she's got to she's got to make a choice. Uh, there's something going on with her interrogating a prisoner that Curtis isn't uh, sort of questioning. So there's a lot more conflict amongst that group uh, on the rewatch than I had remembered the first time. And, um, you know, Catherine is very clearly telling Kira, you know, you need to turn over a original Alec. He's the problem because he's the one who's furthest from the Alec of the future. And in the background, we have the CMR of dead Kira still rendering and reconstructing. And um, when Kira goes to turn in Alec, give over 
I'll call it the slice of the time ta travel device, one of the time travel devices. Um, the CMR finishes uploading and Kira sees that it's Curtis who shot her and outs him at the end. So, you know, all kinds of stuff happens, you know, really in the last minute of this episode. Yeah, and um, and it was interesting watching this now to see that uh, that that mysterious guy in the cell at the freelancers that Catherine was talking to and says is you know confusing and not sure if he's you know if he's telling them anything useful. You know how far back that went. I, I, I we we see him more at the end of season three and and uh, on first re watch I didn't even remember that they had had mentioned that cell and, and the fact that there was somebody in there uh, prior to that. So that was pretty cool to see. Um, it's also really cool knowing how it, how it went down as because we saw it with the two Alex in the office and then Kira showing up. And then knowing in the future that Kira calls out the fact that this is what the final straw that broke the camel's back. And this is why she made the decision she made, but she made it under the wrong – for the wrong reasons because she didn't interpret what happened there properly. You know, we, we know it was – I'll call him the good Alec because he's our Alec, the, the one who went back in time. Um, is the one who's sitting at the desk and helping her with the Samantha problem. And she thinks it's the other Alec who did that. And she thinks that the, the, the Alec, the time traveling Alec came in with a gun going crazy, trying to attack or assault the, you know, the, 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 the one who's trying to help her. And that's why she, the final straw, and she made the decision. She said, he's too much of a wild card. Okay, we're going to turn him over. Whereas he was the one who was helping her and the other one doesn't really like her very much. Um, and, and it was sad to see that from our perspective, we saw what happened, but from her perspective, you know, she, she was clueless at that point of exactly what happened. She, she had the exact opposite interpretation of, of what went down. Um, it was also very sad to see Emily, uh, waiting for Alec and, and realizing that he wasn't going to come and realizing that either meant he was captured or dead probably and, and her moving on or doing something. We don't, we don't know what she's going to go do, I guess, just leaving town. She obviously can't, um, can't do anything with the, the Alec that's left at Pyron. Uh, it was also kind of touching in a way. Um, Cameron's, like you talked about, uh, her her belief all along that Sonmanto had saved her life, that uh, that 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 corporation had come through and and was her savior and had saved her life, and then coming to the realization now, later in her life, but in the past, that they may have been the ones who actually created the thing that almost killed her, and then just happened to uh, save her in time, it just kind of shatters that that comfort zone she had uh, of her life before. So uh, some, some pretty good movement in this one. Yeah, as you both said, it's, it's showing, again, the layers uh, and understanding more about some of the character actions. Certainly the rewatch does that very, very well. Uh, liberates a bigger plan. Again, if we're this far back as they ended up going further than they wanted, how can we stop that future? The whole corporate Congress, the corporation's getting too much power. Well, let's take one of the cornerstones of that, Samanto, and uh, out them and uh, use public opinion to really help create that negative field for them. Not only this fact that this uh, this waste product, which folks doesn't don't believe is anything, uh, it's anything really bad, but when put with something else, creates the weapon. Not only that, but that they had already sold it to some third world country or some other country somewhere, Chesnia or something that came through too. So um, it's just further showing that they're you know, trying to destroy it from within and doing a very good job in the ways that they choose to do this. So pretty interesting. And as you said too, Brent, this uh, is just, again, further eroding Kira's belief of that, you know, doing my air quotes, I have to get back to my future and realizing just how flawed it was and, and just how, how much it's uh, fragile and everything else. This is just another situation where instead of uh, they were this company that uh, had the antidote to save her after that was used on the battlefield. So not only that, that's because they were the ones who created it in the first place. So it, it's tough. And her having to make the choice here between the Alex, again, that that's something that's going to weigh on her heart uh, and having to make that pick, which made logical sense. Cause again, this is the Alec, uh, as I refer to him, scar Alec from, you know, the bullet that got fired when he went that uh, gave him the scar um, is the one who's saying, I, that screw it. I'm just heading out to the, to the woods or wherever with Emily. So there's very little chance he will become the Alex Sadler that she needs and that the freelancers want to keep the timeline straight. So it makes logical sense what she did. And uh, she's just seeing more and more of the fracturing of the freelancers when obviously, as you said, Wendy, when the CMR data is completed and she sees 
who it was that killed her and, and puts him under good point as we see the episode end. So uh, this is reminding me too of very much, even though we're about halfway through the th- third season, things are really starting to going to crank up from here on uh, the bigger story arc towards the end of season three. Some other very, very cool stuff about what's coming. So pretty interesting. Brad, 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 Brad coming soon. Brad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You raise a good point, Brent, about, um, uh, on the rewatch, I was definitely paying a lot more attention to what was going on with the freelancers. And I had no idea they'd ever mentioned, I'll call him the prisoner uh, that we see later, earlier at all. So I was completely surprised. I was like, oh, here's another breadcrumb I didn't realize we had. But um, they just did a great job with laying down all this track. And, uh, you know, the show's got so much stuff going on that, you know, just following the basic plot of our key characters, it, it's easy to miss a lot of this stuff. So this rewatch has been great fun for, for that and just to get an even better appreciation for how this show is put together. Yeah, it was kind of sad to see, you know, some posts on social media recently too, that they've wrapped the filming up the, you know, the final season. I mean, we're looking forward to seeing it, don't get me wrong, but to, to see posts like that, realizing that the end, you know, short of some big fan revival or maybe a movie or two, uh, you know, all the filming was done, the principal shooting. So that was kind of sad. I'll be fine, honestly. I've said this before, but I will be happy at the end of Continuum. I won't be sad that we won't get any more because they have the opportunity to end it right. And a good, well-told story, no matter how long, it's worth it. Yeah, oh, I it agree. Is. Sometimes you can't be greedy about that stuff. Yeah, yeah, supernatural. <laughs> Small um, Yeah, oh. some shows have uh, <laughs> overstayed their expiration dates. <laughs> uh, but one show last I want to talk about that has not is Salem, which is uh, very deep into season two. And some crazy stuff. I mean, uh, the, every week I probably say there's some crazy stuff going on in this show because the storyline keeps turning in ways that are very unpredictable to me, uh, at least. So this week, uh, we have Stuart Townsend, who's introduced as the doctor, who's come because there's this um, this plague that's taken over in Salem. And he goes out with Cotton Mather, and he figures out not only that Mary is a witch, but what she did is what triggered the plague. And he goes and calls her out, and of course Mary is expecting... The typical, you know, somebody in authority is coming in to tell them that they're going to out her, burn at the stake, kill her, whatever. And instead, he's like, no, I'm a scientist, and I think that witchcraft is just science that we haven't explained yet. And he wants to be her ally. He's all in to learn witchcraft, (laughs) and they have a very... um crazy sexy initiation into him learning about witchcraft (laughs) um we also have tichuba has kidnapped john alden and has him prisoner and she recognizes all these markings that he has all over himself from uh his time with the native americans getting i'll say juiced up on mojo which i think is going to be a bad thing for john alden but they might possibly form an alliance, but maybe not because he keeps having visions of Mary. We also have, I'll call her Countess Lucy Lawless's character, who you guys may have remembered. There was a, a witch named Mercy that Mary had taken under her wing, but really hadn't treated very well. And she'd actually tried to kill her. And the Countess heals her, turns her back uh, looking normal and now has her doing her bidding, and her bidding is to win over um, Mary's son, who's also named John Alden, who is the, he is the son of the devil, or he has the devil inside him, which he clearly does based on what they've shown uh, him do. He's really creepy. And that's going to be very interesting to see how they play out uh, the storyline of this kid and bringing forth, you know, the real devil, which is uh, Lucy Lawless's character's agenda. We also had um, some very interesting stuff going on 
with Anne, who is the, I'll call her the natural witch, who keeps on learning about her powers. And she was able to open up her father's grimoire and start learning more from that. And she's also formed an alliance with Cotton Mather. Um, Mary had actually resurrected Cotton Mather's father because he was the guy who originally had expelled the countess or bested her. I'm not exactly sure. The, uh, he he stopped her from doing this ritual like a hundred years ago or something. Time is timey-wimey on this show sometimes, but he's he's revived as a ghost. There's a very poignant scene where he actually goes to visit his son and have one of those, I forgive you, son. I actually loved you speeches, but it was very well played by the actor. So Salem continues to be very surprising and very entertaining. Very cool. Um, like I said, uh, in the main show, I have finished season one. I watched like the last four or five episodes last week, and uh, it did ramp up. Every episode was getting better and better and better. And by the last episode, I I, I was watching it. I, I've been watching them kind of in the background as I do other stuff. In the last episode, I was like, I, I can't look away. I need to I need to watch all of this. So uh, I'm looking forward to catching up on season two. Uh, uh, it was interesting when you talk just a bit about mercy and being used and uh realizing that all through the first season she kept being used so the poor girl just continues to be used apparently yeah but in po- in season 2 she's much less sympathetic as she gets used and she's also getting getting some paybacks herself in season 2 as well mercy is not a sympathetic character i have to admit even though she should be but Isaac is, if you recall him, he's sort of the guy who's been helping Mary. Isaac the fornicator? Yes. He continues to be um, a, a guy who has a lot of heart and keeps on getting um, nothing good for it. <laughs> it's season two also. I saw a few friends mentioning the, the craziness of Salem, so you're just reinforcing it. Well, it really is. Um, you know, it, it's got that penny, dreadful, creepy sort of vibe to it, but very different from Pe- Penny Dreadful, because Penny Dreadful is very much about the Victorian times. And this is very much when America is still wild and, and people believe in very much the literalness of everything supernatural so it's it's more primitive and the witchcraft is a little bit more primitive too i think so i think that's going to be it for me and i want to thank everyone for listening and thank kevin and brent for a lot of fun we'll see you again soon catch you next time take care everybody if you'd like to contact tuning into sci-fi tv we offer a variety of feedback options including email at feedback at tuning into sci-fi tv.com voicemail at 206-202-4182 Skype voicemail at tuning into sci fi TV, or you can visit our blog and forums at tuning into sci fi TV.com. And finally, you can find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash tuning into sci fi, or at Facebook by following the link on our website. Tuning into Sci-Fi TV was hosted by Kevin Batchelder, Wendy Hembrock, and Brent Barrett. The theme music for Tuning into Sci-Fi TV is by Beatnik Turtle. Used with permission. Listen to Tuning into Sci-Fi TV on Stitcher Radio On Demand. Download the free app today at stitcher.com. You've been listening to the Tuning into Sci-Fi TV Last Call for episode 339, recorded May 30th, 2015.